Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the UNFCCC Pavilion at COP28 with an extraordinary panel of women who are working on different and complementary aspects of mobilizing finance and mobilizing people, networks, social infrastructure to support transformation and particularly to accelerate, deepen and scale the movement to climate positive futures and a climate positive world. We are going to do this session in a couple of ways. We will start with a big open question and each of the panelists will be reflecting from their own perspective and practice on what is happening. And then we'll open up a little bit of more specific debate into some of the big root cause issues and change, structural change opportunities relevant to this question. But let me start, and in the interest of time, just introduce very briefly who we have on this panel. So starting on the end here, we have Neelam Kibber, who is one of the critical change agent activists and founder of co-founder of Catalyst 2030. We have Ariesta Ningrum, who is head of the climate technology mechanism within the UNFCCC. We have Heba Aguib, who is member of the board at the BMW Foundation. Franny Loitia, Chief Executive Office at Southbridge Investments. Leslie Johnston, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Laudas Foundation. And joining us online, Felicitas von Peter, who is Chief Executive Officer at Active Philanthropy. Felicitas, we can see you beautifully highlighted against a forest. Thank you very much for choosing something that brings that into the room. Okay, so let me start. My name is Kirsten Dunlop. I'm another chief executive officer. There seems to be too many of us, I think, <laughs> of uh, an organization called the IT Climate Kick, proud to be partnered with the UNFCCC Secretariat and working on climate solutions with a particular focus on systemic change. And of course, this panel is very much about individuals and organizations working to intervene in ways that work to achieve systemic change outcomes. So each of you is building the social infrastructure, the financial infrastructure, the delivery mechanisms to enable, to empower, to equip communities to change, to achieve change. The question we're here to ask ourselves and to discuss with each other is what is working in 2023 as we reflect on the state of a polycrisis world? What is inhibiting? And what next? And that's not a what next in terms of what's the business as usual scenario, but what next, what do we try next to get to a scale and a pace of change remotely commensurate with what we need to achieve? Leslie, can I start with you? Great, thank you. So I'm representing a philanthropic foundation and Felicitas will also speak to the role of philanthropy. But I think what's working right now is that we do have a groundswell of new funders coming on board, philanthropic funders that are willing not only to de-risk um, things that need to happen, where maybe there's a market failure, um, but also doing what philanthropy does really well, which is bringing together unlikely allies, um, enabling, creating an enabling environment, trying to change the rules of the system. So there's a lot of things around the system right now that don't allow us to have effective north-south collaboration where everyone can thrive and foundations can play that role. So for example, we're doing a lot of work in landscapes um, in India, Pakistan, Tanzania, and Brazil, where effectively we're trying to help farmers diversify their income, mobilize investment, um, well, actually get some funding from the insetting of the carbon, but then link to markets. And the missing piece there is often the link to markets. You know, does a brand really wanna work differently with farmers when they're sourcing a commodity like cotton? It's hard. So that's where philanthropy can come in, can bring all these players together, and hopefully unlock finance, support the farmers, but more importantly, strengthen that market mechanism. Thank you, Leslie. Felicitas, do you want to build on that, then, this question around philanthropy and impact? Yes, very happy to do so, and uh, good morning from cold Berlin. Um, I agree with Leslie that new funders have come in. I think some, what we forget sometimes is that Paris is only eight years ago, and I notice a real difference before and post Paris. Before Paris, we still had the debate, is there climate change or not? After Paris, that changed. But that's only a couple of years ago. And I think 
what we need to do is to help more funders get on board because very often funders are still lost as to where to enter and how to make a personal difference. We run flagship programs to Greenland to raise awareness for climate, and we often see people being extremely interested in how to make a difference, but not really knowing where they can make the biggest difference given that the hour is so late. So I think what we need to do also as an ecosystem is to help funders identify exactly where they can come on board. That might sound ironic to this room because we know that everywhere is the right place to go. But especially on the systems change that needs to happen in order to have, make a difference, it's very difficult for new funders to come on board. So one of the things we've been setting up is training programs, online training programs, where we have a lot of members from the Global North and Global South learning together. Thank you. Felicitas, you and Leslie both spoke around this notion of bringing unlikely allies together, new actors on board, and I referred to this session as being about the social infrastructure of connecting networks, creating this kind of meshwork of individuals, organizations, and communities working together. Neelam, what's your perspective on what does that look like? How do you contribute to this question? So at uh, uh, Catalyst 2030, they're calling it the connective issue, uh, tissue. Yeah. So I actually am a founder of an organization in India called Indus. TRWE, and uh, we work with communities for many years, enabling them and women to move into global supply chains. So we've got a large collective, 3,000 women, who are doing circular economy products, essentially making home accessories from banana bark for IKEA. So we solve that issue first. So we talk about working at the intersection of equity, climate, and gender. But markets need to act. So you've got women collectives. The Indian government is building millions of Indian collectives in every Indian state from women. It's the National Rural Livelihood Mission under the Ministry of Rural Development. They've, it's an $80 billion budget annually. So how do we leverage all that thought? And how do we look at India's 1.4 billion Africa is 1.4 billion, and maybe the rest of the global south, the global majorities, populations, and economies growing in a more regenerative way, moving their food and fashion and lifestyle into global supply chains, right? So I'll stop here now, but that's exactly the kind of work that's happening at the global network, Catalyst 2030. We've got like 3,000 innovators from the global south, global north, coming together to bring out these kind of solutions. And frankly, just saying one thing, the climate action and SDG action need not be different. There is a huge connection that we all need to talk more about. Yeah. Indeed, this is actually one of the questions I've been noticing, that strange dance between climate and SDG in all of our discussions that somehow doesn't quite intersect. So let me, in that case, turn to you, Ariesta, since, of course, the technology mechanism is right embedded in the heart of that nexus at a national scale. How do you see this working in national scales? What's working? What's the inhibitors? Yes, thank you. I'm um, from the UNFCCC and perhaps slightly give a different perspective here from the international uh, or global perspective, and particularly as mentioned by um, uh, Kirsten, uh, technology mechanism is working um, on the policy level, uh, global policy level, and we're looking into what we call national systems of innovation. Um, this is something that um, mainly would be driven by the government, but this is a very important because uh, we're looking into six different um, 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 successful, let's put it that way, um, in India is one of them, um, with the establishment of Bureau Energy Efficiency, in Kenya for the uh, Climate Innovation Center, in Brazil for the uh, bioethanol, and we're looking what's actually working. And one thing um, that perhaps share uh, um, a view here is the systemic approach is happening in all of those. So 
we're talking about the local, but even at the national level, what we found that the systemic approach aligning with the country's goal is working. And this is, I guess, that um, relates to your point of how this is connected to the climate and development goals. Because if we're all working together in this, this is, would be something that um, can, can make a radical changes. So at the national, but as well as supported by the local level. And that's the other um, 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 finding from, from, particularly from this work, that participation among local actors, um, universities, the local communities, the, um, 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 everyone that's involved is really, really critical. So I, I stop there, but um, there is a lot more to share in the next intervention, thanks. Thank you. Well, in, we have in fact talked about this notion of addressing markets, communities, structures, and networks. So we are talking about a multi-actor, multi-scale, multi-level way of working. How do you see that from the perspective of a corporate foundation, an industry foundation, Heather? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question because we are uh, a global network foundation. The, we have a responsible leaders network with 2,500 responsible leaders globally, and we've been very uh, strongly connected to the responsible leaders and to a lot of local solutions for global action and uh, looking at it from the global perspective and back. So uh, it's amazing to see the development of like-minded people coming together and pulling forces and, and, and bring them together to inspire each other and connect uh, uh, and even do concrete investments. And as you're saying, uh, Kirsten, we're also a corporate foundation and we have a responsibility in making sure that the decision making, the scaling of solutions, uh, 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 solving the problem on the bigger scale and having an aligned agenda in order to push all of us uh, together in one direction, stop um, uh, doing too many things at the same time, but put the forces that we have as a philanthropy and other philanthropies have and what industry and other industries have and what policy uh, makers and policy innovators should do together so that we can make the shift happen. So definitely there is a need to make empower like-minded people, but to increase the circle, enhance the circle of like-minded to be with all decision makers on the table. We cannot talk about scalability without having industry and policy making at the table. And currently I would say we become very comfortable in being exclusive inclusive and <laughs> like w w it's a time where people don't come together because it's too it's like too much uh, othering or uh, having the feeling we are changing the world because we're thinking in the right way and those who build the problems are not going to solve them no it's not going to be solved unless we're all working together and this is our role as a philanthropy to make this um, connect this communication uh, this conversation uh, link to action and talk about what's missing to make the scale happen, to make the execution happen, to have a roadmap uh, that's uh, uh, pushing towards the goals. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to then the picture that we are drawing here, but I would love to bring you in at this point, Fanny, on the question of what you see as being what's working and uh, where do you see some of the the hindering elements still in what we're doing. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten. It's always good to speak last in my case uh, because I have a chance to hear what others are saying. I think there are three major things that are changing or working. The first one is really a realization that what we've been doing for years is not reaching the communities and individuals and therefore saying, how do we do that? So the perception and the reality of reaching communities and individuals is changing. Secondly, we now have the means to actually do that, which perhaps you could argue before we didn't. We have digital technologies which make no excuse for you to say you can't get finance down to the individual because payment systems are working very well. But the third thing I think which is really critical is we have other technologies. So for example, now you can get the carbon emission or sequestration of a one by one meter of earth. You can get tree by tree sequestration levels. So if I'm a farmer and I have three trees, 
I can participate in the carbon markets, which before was impossible. So to me, these three things have changed. Now, what's left to be done, I think, is a lot. <laughs> First, uh, I'm very happy to be sitting here amongst philanthropists because I believe this year was the first year at COP where we have business and philanthropy meeting together officially for two days. That means there's a huge space where co together we can make change. I think I'm the only one from business on the panel, so perhaps I can speak uh, for business. Uh, we've, we see the opportunity to work with philanthropy in different ways. First, in testing, learning, and then scaling. Because once you test and learn, business can scale. But testing and learning is costly. Even if you have a very rich innovation budget, it's quite difficult to do, especially if you are from a business like mine where I had to put in my personal capital to start. So you, you have no more left to invest in innovation. So we really rely on philanthropy for that. Second is in pushing these large systems to change. So for example, we are signatories to the UN triple, UNFCCC deforestation initiative for financial institutions. We are the only African financial institution to be a signatory. And what do we do with that? We've used that UN level policy change to drive our own investment decisions. So at the transaction level, we can push change. And then thirdly, uh, I think this whole idea that you can take the reforms of multilateral development banks, reforms of the financial actors through G funds and other actions, and then drive them to reach that individual and community, which is what we do. We are members of G funds. We've signed up as signatories of the Mangrove Initiative. We are members of the uh, uh, Carbon Markets Initiative for Africa. So as a small company, we are preparing the groundwork and moving our activities to push those global agreements and regional agreements. And why can we do this? Because we believe in it, right? We started with a philosophy or theology, you could say, that it's possible, and then we work with that in, as part of our decision-making process. So there is a remarkable range of interventions, of, of scale, of, of philosophy, of approach, of leadership commitment, and of a sense of progress is being made. And yet it's COP28. Progress is horribly off track for where we are. And we are, as, as in fact you in many ways have observed, not getting resource to where it needs to get in the ways in which it to get, at the scale, at the pace. So if we were to ask ourselves, what would it take in the next two to three years for any one of you to be confident that your way of mobilizing resources is getting to climate positive futures. What needs to change? Okay, kick off. I'm getting a little philosophical. In foundations, we love to talk in more kind of systems terms. I do think we are in a crisis situation where mindsets, rules, and power all have to change. Now, what does that actually mean? Mindsets is a toughest one. I mean, it's great to sit next to you and learn everything that you're doing as a business and you're really pioneering. But a lot of businesses are lagging. The leaders don't really know how to tackle it. How do you get folks to understand not only the case for change, but the urgency and have tools to make that change? I'm sure Hedley will talk a little bit about that. Um, rules. Business ain't going to change itself. You need to change the rules of the system. There are efforts right now. I think it's fantastic, especially European legislation that's trying to raise the bar. But is that bar going high enough? Is it doable for business? Do they know how to deal with it? And what does that mean for businesses and countries in producing countries? Well, if you're talking about the textile industry, do they really know what corporate sustainability directive means for Bangladeshi garment manufacturers? So a lot of change there, but power. We don't really talk about people yet, and Neelam, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, but we need to put people at the center of what we're trying to do, and usually those that have the most to lose have the weakest voice. So how do we get workers, producers, communities, tenants, if you're working in buildings? I'm at a karaoke uh, club right now, but how do you get, it's the energy, but how do you get people to be at the table, have a voice, and be part of the solution? And I know we all talk about just transition, but what does that mean? And are we all willing as philanthropy, business, investments, civil society to do the hard stuff to get the right people? 
Anyone else? Thank you, Leslie. Uh, maybe two quick points. Um, I'm struck by how, when you come from a developing country, these big debates around nature, climate, SDGs, go away. Because in Africa, where I come from, climate is daily life. If you look at the risks that the individual African is facing today, flooding, droughts, uh, the, the massive uh, deforestation that's taking place and the impact it has then on productive systems, that links up to poverty, the ability to get revenues, to get the right nutrition, to be able to move from one place to the other. So when you look at the SDGs and you look at them against climate risks and nature, they are completely interrelated. So I think for most developing countries, there shouldn't be a debate between SDG versus climate versus nature. And these big conferences really need to, and I think the focus on people allows you to move away from that. And then the second big thing, and I think here perhaps uh, I feel very comfortable sitting amongst philanthropists uh, because I've been working with the philanthropic crowd for quite a while. Uh, you have this Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, founded by three major philanthropies. You have Rockefeller Foundation, Ikea Foundation, and the Bezos Earth Fund. And it's all targeted to bring renewable energy systems to affordable price points for the average person. So battery technology, for example, bringing down the cost of making batteries so that the average person can afford it. Or looking at distributed renewable energy systems, bringing the cost down. Those kind of actions cannot be done only by the technologists or by the uh, utilities or by the individual farmer or, or, or actor in, in a, a small uh, growing economy. But it also can't be done only by philanthropies. And this is why I like those kind of models, because the philanthropic capital is bring there to catalyze, to incentivize, and to coalesce. Uh, private capital in a way that it's not doing right now. And I think that is a massive change I see in the role philanthropy is playing. And the last point I said, I would said too, but I think we can't leave leadership out. And I know being a member of the Responsible Leaders Network of the BMW Foundation, I feel that powerfully because when I travel around the world, I meet people like me who are members of that network and together we've been able to do quite amazing things just because we are part of the network. So I think the role philanthropy plays also in developing and connecting those leaders makes a difference. Thank you. Beherbe, do you want to build on that? Yes, um, and thank you for bringing up um, uh, leadership and responsible leadership. It is definitely very important to focus on leaders and the decision makers and bring them in forms of um, uh, in negotiations for implementation. And this is um, the question about the next uh, two to three years because we're having a major strategic shift on how to, 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 to uh, uh, bring the power of the network and the ability to act into exactly where the conversation is ending and the dialogue in trusted rooms is ending, where we need to start implementation. And it's our role and responsibility to talk about implementation, showcase, have these rooms of designing and co-designing solutions uh, with leaders, with the collective intelligence globally, while the decisions are being taken, collect the efforts and focus, focus, focus. And then really have very clear communication and, and talk about narratives that are clearly showing the opportunity of working together and of taking the right decisions as a, lead, as a leader and showing uh, the way. I think uh, through, uh, by showing that it's possible, we can, move a lot of people to change. And, and maybe um, an example here, we just started a collaboration with the German presidency where we're talking about economic transformation and societal transition and what needs to be done to make sure that the winners and losers while going through that transformation process um, uh, uh, are being understood and that we're taking them on the way and how to deal with this. So this closeness to the community, which uh, many here on this panel specifically have at the heart are, is, is a very crucial part and needs to be integrated in the thinking so we can shift and change the framework like we discussed prior to this uh, panel. So let me build on that and I'm going to, and this is kind of extending Felicitas, Neelam, uh, Arias to thinking about 
your perspectives on this. We, we are talking about the critical, the challenge of getting people really to the table and people who have the most to lose, as you rightly say. How do they have a voice? That this cannot be done by individuals alone, so there is some form of, or at least orchestrating mechanism that is needed. And we need to connect anything happening with decision-making systems and decision-making um, frameworks and practices. But very often we're also talking about an institutionalized set of practices of the way finance assumes it needs to move, fears about loss, risk, risk aversion, and that creates a professionalized class of people who know how to handle finance, which is not necessarily the people who are most at risk. So how do we get past our own best of intentions, self-limiting practices on responsible impact, for example? I'm happy to go last, Mister. <laughs> Um, I think it's very interesting conversation um, uh, in terms of connecting to the global decision making. Um, I'm not saying, as a UNFCCC, I'm not saying that the COP is everything, but the reality is when we uh, negotiated for Paris Agreement, there is a lot of, we had um, um, the UNFCC, former UNFCC Executive Secretary, um, Cristiana Figueres, uh, created a um, groundswell initiative. And this is actually to bring the business and the non-party stakeholders to actually put a pressure. And guess what? This is actually the one that made the Paris working. That Paris can send a positive signal that we need to have 1.5 or 2 degree at that point of time, 2 degree, but no one's talking about 2 degree anymore. Now it's 1.5. So we can still do this now, especially with the urgency. So I, I'm, I'm so happy that we have a business and philanthropy forum established now continue voicing your voice through this kind of channel, through any arrangements that's happening that have access to the global decision making. And again, I'm not only talking about climate, if you are very involved in the SDG, then please use that platform also. I think the more voices that we make and send to the uh, decisions maker or the policy makers nationally or locally, um, it's better because the push has to come. Um, we now have announcement after announcement about the loss and damage funding, right? That is because there's a lot of push from the community, particularly on the vulnerable community. And, and, and therefore, um, um, it, you know, it's just a, a miracle decision that it's done in the beginning of the COP. And yesterday, I heard that it's already reached $700 million in the funding. Um, never happened before. So we can, if we can work together and, and keep the pressure, to the government, to the policymaker, and through different forums like what I mentioned before, then I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that things and changes that we need is actually can happen. Thank you. Felicitas, should I, can I bring you in? It's always hard yes. when you're on video. No, no, that's totally fine. Thank you very much. Um, yes, 700 million have been pledged, but as far as I know, it takes about 100 million to move one small village. So 700 million is really just the start. And I think one of the issues we have is we need a power shift within philanthropy as well. Um, we have a lot of philanthropy that is still structured in traditional ways because it is still set in the, in the global north, uh, where we don't have recipients as part of the decision making. We don't have grantees as representative on boards. Uh, so it's very difficult to build this human connection if you don't see the reality, if you don't bring the reality in the room. And so I think we we also need to work on ourselves in the global north and question uh, our own structures that are still uh, very often stuck in the old ways. Um, I think the second part that needs to happen is that we need to look at philanthropy in a different way. I mean, right now, only 2% of philanthropy goes into climate change, which is ridiculous. Um, but we need to focus on the intersections of where climate intersects with the traditional ways of giving to health, to gender, to equity. But I think also philanthropy very often has been seen more as a, as a, uh, as a Band-Aid, as, as, as charity, and I'm not talking about the bubble we all live in. I'm talking about the mainstream philanthropy that's out there. That's the, the bulk of the 600 billion that's given every year. 
So I think where philanthropy can really help is, as Leslie said, in the convening, but also in focusing attention on uh, the role of finance, on the on the not delivered uh, promises, on um, supporting movements that set the right kinds of incentive. That means that philanthropy has to be very close to the ground and very flexible and very nimble and very entrepreneurial. And I think that's something that we need to push as a sector as well through collaboration between private and corporate philanthropies, through collaboration between uh, philanthropy and the finance sector and impact investing through better bridges between north and south uh, and through focusing on what are the most important levers to speak more with one voice for new philanthropists coming in on where they can make the biggest difference and and uh, really focus on the on the systems that Leslie talked about uh, which is why uh, Laudas, Laudas work is so important for the sector. Thank you very much Felicitas. Neelam, to finish this reflection. I have a lot to say here. Yeah. So I, I, I just think the whole, everyone said everything. I'll just try to knit it up, right? I started my journey in the private sector. I believe any rigor, anything that we do is because of that journey, right? But nothing is going to happen only with private sector money. I ran a for-profit business. I raised $10, $20 million in impact investment. And finally, I had to go back and invest the last six years in my nonprofit, right? I worked with the governments in the past. So blended finance, I think the, one of the biggest mindset shifts needs to happen around blended finance. So the world, I, I talk to philanthropists all the time. And to answer uh, to Felicitas, if there's only 2% in climate action, you add SDG and you combine SDG and climate action, which it naturally is, it's 100%. So why these silos first and foremost? You do not need SDG and climate action silos. So I'll talk about that a little more. That is linked to proximal leadership and local leadership. You've all been talking about that, right? So I've learned all these terms at Catalyst 2030. We get funded by USAID in our work in India. 2% of their funding was going to local actors. Now it's 26%. But even then, a bulk of that is going through the people who worked out of DC for years, now have set up branch offices in India. But this whole local leadership, proximal leadership, getting closer to the philanthropists, India is going to be the third largest economy in the world in the next 10 years. Your responsible leaders program, so critical for our high net worth individuals. So the top 10 people, they are now sort of trying to outpace each other, our top 10 richest people on giving, they'll be the ideal givers because they're so close to the problem. But they need the global leadership to kind of get them into the act. We've got one woman, Rohini Nilakeni. She's amazing, but she's got the other nine to kind of ramp up. I'll just share one example. I'm sorry I may, if I talk a little long. But I'll share one example on the local leadership and the proximal leadership showing the answers. So we've got this huge unicorn in India called Zero Da, made like he's a billionaire. He founded a hundred million dollar climate fund for India. I met the CEO. I said, okay, he said, 18 months I've studied, what should I do for India? I said, more power to you. What have you discovered? And that's the entire premise he whiteboarded. It's such an example of local leadership and proximal leadership emerging with the change. That I share that slide with everyone on the planet now. He said, first of all, if I have to spend $100 million in India, what will I measure? He said, I will measure reduction in carbon, reduction in emission, reduction in waste, and reduction in vulnerability. Then he went to the other side of the board and he said, what are the seven indicators? Increase in income, increase in livelihood, increase in health, increase in equity, increase in localization. He had one thing linked directly to climate, increase in biodiversity. But all his six indicators were against reduction in vulnerability. And then I looked at that and I said, 
But when we work on reduction in vulnerability, we often go into connection with women. So the connection between gender and climate that he made was like amazing. But this is a guy with $100 million in his back pocket taking a decision locally after speaking to Indian think tanks, Indian, and he said, you know, 70% of the action is the food, fashion, and lifestyle sector, construction, built environment. A third, our world's third largest polluter is the men, right? And he said, so, anyway, I'm just saying, the guy funds us, he's, uh, he's, he's from an organization called Brain Matter Foundation, yeah? But we are building bamboo, for example. We are now, we're now doing a massive thing around scaling bamboo for India, for the global south. But that's going to help in construction industry, lifestyle as well. But it's regenerative plantation, it's a carbon sink, it pulls carbon out of, out of the atmosphere, right? But, so, just, I don't know if I managed to thread everything together, but financing for that, oh yes, I know what I have to say. Last one minute. So we've got a $15 million innovative finance instrument seeded by USAID to plant 3,000 acres of bamboo in one eco agroecological zone with smallholder women farmers. They will plant the bamboo. They will earn for the next 30 years. They will carbon sequester. They will do everything you said. Right? They'll become rich. Now, with that $15 million instrument seeded largely by philanthropy, we are moving to a $100 million instrument, right? And then with that, we are moving to government programs, easily a billion dollars. But philanthropic catalytic capital is the key. And if I may, and this is going to uh, open to a, a reflection before, and I'm warning everyone in the audience, we are about to get to the point where I'm going to be asking you for your questions or reflections. And mindsets. So let's just come back to this question of people, because each of you have referred to people in different ways, and we are talking about institutional shifts, practice shifts, structural shifts, but underpinning that is our capacity to think differently and act differently. So the how question is not just a question of institutions, it's really ultimately a question of, of mindsets. If I think about my experience of working in this very integrated systemic way where you stop talking about climate and you start talking about the entire question of the human design for life, our resources, our well-being, one of the biggest immediate patterns of reaction I get is, okay, but that's a bit too big. Let's break it down into small parts and think about it as projects because that's just too complex. We can't do that. And that pattern of continuing to projectize, to silo, to separate, to compartmentalize, that's a huge mindset shift. Where have you seen those kinds of shifts happen, where people are beginning to act and think in complex, integrated ways? All right. Um, great question. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we are humans that really uh, are, well, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, it starts us, our families, our communities, we are local beings. So I think where we have seen that shift is areas where we've actually rejected perhaps the way things are done and looked for new ways of doing things. And I'll give just a very quick example in the built environment. Neela mentioned that. 40% of emissions, big issues. Buildings are big, you build it, it's there for 60 years. There's lots of stakeholders, but one of the stakeholders who's not at the table, community. And we are exper experimenting with different models of ownership where communities actually have a stake, community land trusts. And that's where they have a voice at the table. They have a stake, they become owners, and therefore they can influence what happens when you need to rapidly de decarbonize and not leave anyone behind. That's kind of a bonkers idea, because when you think about building a building and the millions and millions that's needed, you don't really think about, let's do this in a way that actually sets up a trust that the community participates in. But that's being piloted across Europe, which is super exciting. And so I would actually urge from a mindset shift, let's actually shift the business model and test new ways. Which also means then going after our property models and get rid of freehold and go for fairhold. So big property shifts. Heber. So um, I'll take a, also a, a specific example. When we started to respond to an impact tech accelerator, 
uh, we wanted to support technology with uh, sustainability in the core and make sustainability uh, a currency and count and measure them. So if we take the example of impact investing or impact tech, uh, the biggest shifts come when you make impact measurable, when you make our work as philanthropy measurable and accountable, when you can quantify, and I'll take here uh, an example from engineering because I was in med tech for uh, many years and when you deal with heart disease, it's all soft, it's all very difficult to measure. Uh, but the breakthroughs in, in the innovation in healthcare and, 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 and medical technologies comes when you sit with the doctors and sometimes even the patients and try to quantify uh, difficult to grasp things, difficult to measure things. And then you can say, uh, I, I remember there were conversations where I would sit with a doctor and say, you know what, my simulation numbers show that this patient will do better and he would tell me the patient died today. And I was like, okay, so let's go back to the loop. I know it's a hard example, but it's just the technical solution might not fit the, the, the practice. The, the, the on the ground feeling and the community's feeling might not fit uh, what, what's being done in the lab. There are so many translational research, translational analysis, transla translation to happen between sectors. Uh, and, and we talked a lot about making the business case and making and 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 looking into the different ways to make the finance uh, fi uh, finance work, financial model work, the the, the corporate to invest, the, the private and and philanthropy to work together. So there's a lot to be done by making things tangible and understand the languages of different players in the room now. Yeah, Fanny. Last reflection on this. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm struck uh, by, first of all, uh, all women panel of CEOs. So you don't change the way things are done if you don't change who is talking and who is listening. And the biggest change I see is when you engage communities, you get the innovation in practice, because that's the daily life. And so by asking the people who are actually experiencing the challenges, you get the best innovation. And for that to work, then you need this kind of decision-making process support, dialogue systems, etc., which all the foundations here and philanthropies are, are doing. The second, and this is, again, I'm sorry to bring this example of women, we are launching here tomorrow a, a report on nature finance written by women. We are all CEOs of important previously or currently organizations. So you have Naoko Ishii, who was leading the GEF, Mari Pangetsu, managing director of the World Bank, Vera Songwe, who was heading the ECA, uh, Isabel, uh, myself. Different way of looking at nature finance, yeah? Because it's a different uh, group of people who are coming to the table to share their perspectives. So I think if you bring in excluded groups, and that includes in this big conference, the indigenous people, very happy to hear the outcome of engaging indigenous people with real money coming on the table, youth, Youth in Africa make up 80% of the population. So in the next decade, if you are young, you will be African. That's the majority of the young people in the world. So what does that mean? Where are the young Africans in this conference? There are very few, even though Dubai is right next to Africa, very easy to get to. So I think we need to do more uh, to engage youth uh, and, of course, other excluded groups. Uh, I mentioned women already. Last point is where the money goes. Because traditionally, finance is a bit lazy in saying, it takes me the same amount of time to give you $2 as to give you $2 billion, because you all the due diligence, etc. So how do we break that? And this is where we actually have been testing and learning through different ways to actually get the same level of scale. So we have a $2 billion reforestation and land restoration fund, but it's going to communities. It doesn't cost us any more to do it that way than, say, to give it to five corporations who then will de generate the carbon. So I think it forces us, and maybe it's only possible because I come from a big family. I'm a daughter of a farmer, and so I know the risks of climate on farming because it meant no shoes for a whole year if the crop is destroyed because then the parents don't have the money to buy you shoes. So at 13 years old, you have to cut the shoes in the front so the feet can grow 
because you can't afford to buy a bigger pair of shoes. So it's personal, very personal. And by engaging people then who experience life that way, you are able to make change. Otherwise, we'll end up another maybe COP50 and we're still talking about this. So I'm very happy this time. We're going to be that, yeah, we may not right. be around. That we find the courage to not be here at COP50. <laughs> okay, let me turn to the audience. So questions, thoughts. What would you love one of the people on this panel to speak to? Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, wonderful panel. Um, my question is about building trust, because we are talking about uh, social infrastructure, we are, we are talking about narratives and illusions we are creating, because all of this is social constructed, the economy, the finance, the investments. So, but if we want all this to happen, we need to build trust among different groups, Global South, Global North, and different ethnic groups, etc. So my question is, uh, how we do that? How can we build trust? And if I may just build on it, how does finance and wielders of financial resources do that? Great question. I think I see Roberta here in the, the yes. Hi, Roberta. So I want to talk about something that we set up that's right now global north, but maybe has the potential to go beyond called the table of trust, because we find that amongst all of us as change makers in the impact space, we sometimes don't trust each other. We don't collaborate. Collaboration is not authentic. I mean, with us, of course, it will be. <laughs> Speaking for myself. No, but I, I think that there is a problem that, okay, I know your question was geared more toward probably more on the community side and building trust, but I think we have to start with ourselves. So with Roberto, we set up this thing called the Table of Trust with uh, Impact Europe, which is actually, it's really cool. It's like a Jeffersonian dinner where you have one question and one discussion and you create bonds of everyone that comes around the table and Kirsten has been part of that. Um, so that's just, it's this mechanism. But I think if we don't take time to create these kind of thoughtful mechanisms and put time in it, it's not gonna happen naturally, more the point. Can I add to that? Um, I think it's very difficult to trust leaders these days because we don't even understand what's, uh, what's the bigger vision and how to get there or trusting how to get there. I think there's a lot of knowledge that's not being shared. Uh, the trust in science is becoming a critical point to s succeed in this difficult time and it's very difficult to trust if you don't have transparency over the process and the goal. And, um, so I want to underline that we have also a responsibility as philanthropies to have to bring more clarity in the process, to make uh, uh, clear communications about what's possible and what's not going to be possible, and align on how to 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 build this trust to society and to the people. Because if you're going to say these are the goals for 2030, no 2035, no 2050. No, maybe you might lose your job tomorrow because we're going to do digitization is coming. And these are, this is very irritating for someone who is in need to trust in, in your leadership. So not Consistency a really matters. Yeah. Felicitas, I'd love to hear your perspective as you bring in those who wish to make a difference but don't know where to start. How do you build trust amongst new investors or newly interested investors? By spending time together and focus on the real difficult questions in an environment that makes you understand that it's all about a common humanity. And it's all about either we all make it or we all fail. Uh, and we use nature. We use nature as a teacher to reconnect us to where we come from and where we know we find the solutions and that makes us get out of our busy heads and into a situation where we just live together and explore together and build trust that way because we're all trying to find new ways to rekindle that connection that we've lost. So I think trust gets built over time uh, uh, and uh, you need to find the right people to 
get out of our normal settings to reestablish new ways of talking without sometimes using words. And that's where nature can be a great tool. Indeed, thank you. Ariesta. Just want to share from the perspective of um, negotiations because building trust is something that's always challenging. But um, this is what's happening actually. Um, you know the, the this, um, illustration about the tip of iceberg. Listening and uh, taking time is for sure. But in the negotiation sense, and I think it's also applicable in other aspects of um, um, our work, is that understanding what's underneath the iceberg. So when you first know people, it's actually they just communicate their needs on the top of the service. But what's most important is actually understanding what's behind the needs and what's motivating the need. And I think if you understand that and show that to them, and I see that all the time in the negotiations, so we're no longer talking about the language, what is behind the language? And it's easier than to communicate. That fundamental human question of what are you really actually attached to, the things that deeply drive that need. So let me close this session with a request to each of you. What is the one, let's call it the one thing, make it composite or make it singular, that you are reflecting upon in your own practice of building networks of action, of trust, of social infrastructure to drive and accelerate and, and build the conditions for transformation? What are you going to be really reflecting and working on as you think about the year to come? Neela, I'm going to start with you. Sure. To us, I mean, to me, from the global south and from India, which is like one of the poorest countries in the world, actually, maximum number of people who live on less than $5 a day actually are in India. So um, we believe that communities, and that's what's driving me, frankly, that communities and women are going to be the most powerful mitigators of climate change on the planet. And that really drives me every day because that energy that's coming from those communities, the women are like, yeah, we can do this. We'll plant the bamboo. We'll do all this. They're so enthusiastic. So I see so much hope, right? That all of us just get our act together because down there, everyone's wanting to do the right thing. All your youth in Africa, so much energy. I was in Nairobi. Seeing the youth, seeing the energy they have, we've just got to build the pathways for them and We'll do 1.5 degrees or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Ariesta. Yes, it is a bit paradox what I'm going to say, but I'm just going to quote the proverb from Africa where if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go successfully, you go together. But the problem is that we don't have the time. So I actually leave it with this reflection. Uh, for me, it's uh, about uh, being excited about thinking and new thinking, the next uh, solutions and, and ways to get there. It's like, it uh, should be a creative, fun process of trying to solve the next challenges and see the opportunities. So to stay positive, use this energy uh, of young leaders and uh, cross-generational uh, to sit on the table and be creative together to solve uh, the next step. Everything is possible if we tackle it and have the intention to do it. So. Thank you. Fanny? Um, for me and for my team, it's uh, how can we bra be brave enough to test new ways of doing things? How can we be humble enough to learn from what we fail <laughs> to achieve? And how can we be patient enough to wait for the success and the impact. If we can maintain that bravery, humility, and patience, I think we will get there. Thank you. Leslie. Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago was Donut Day. Do you know that? Yeah, so this is Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. And what keeps me going is the work that we're doing to rethink the economic system, which includes where leadership takes place. And the core of donut economics is distributed leadership. And to me, the core to getting us out of this mess is to enable and empower leaders at all levels to step up. So that's what gets me excited. 
And I'm trying to live that in my own foundation. We're considering even maybe throwing our strategy out the window and doing a more emergent strategy because ultimately we should be guided by what bubbles up and support uh, that bubbling. My head of strategy is going to kill me when she sees this, but, um, <laughs> but I think we have to do that. And why do we have to do that as foundations? Because there's too much ego in this industry. So let's park our ego at the door, let's park our theories of change at the door, and let's really support, again, I'll probably get fired for saying this, but really support you know, those on, in the field that are actually doing the work. And, and to, to, to build on that, we talked about it because we are going into a more structured approach, <laughs> so we'll have to talk. So we have this exchange, how to, uh, yeah, to build on each other's experience. Geometric and loose, yes. indeed. <laughs> Felicitas. Yeah, two, two goals. Number one is to shift philanthropy uh, to empower women and, and youth to build on the solutions that we have. And number two is to focus on those areas that are really creating a lot of damage, which is industrial decarbonization, where I think philanthropy is still remiss uh, to, uh, to act. So that's the two goals for 2024. Which kind of come back to Leslie's question around how do you change the underlying system that produces the philanthropic gain but is still actually powering up the economy. So thank you so very much. I think one of the things that I observe listening and with the privilege to be able to ask the questions is this extent of how of being able to rise above some of the simple, the two simplistic stories, division between Global North and South, division between those with least and those with most, an ability to reconnect and to find how do positive dynamics of change unleash something that is magical, bigger than all of us, soft, strange, qualitative elements that somehow have the power to change the world. Thank you very much for your courage, for your efforts, and for the space to speak here today.